and I don't know. Um, what I don't know is if um, we can see the heads in the, of the people or if they're just streaming. So I, I think that we cannot see, but we can see the list of the people on yeah. the run, uh, right hand side. I think yeah. It, yeah, there is like five here. That's the, the number of the people in the room. Right, I think that's us, and then I think <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think uh, someone just started. Yeah, but if if you look, if you click that number, you start to see all participants who are on the call. Got it. Yeah, I see. It, it looks like it's um, it looks like it's coming. People are starting to come on in. So yeah, and so they don't see us live. You don't. They don't see us in video live. I think they do. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. We, we yeah, just don't see them. They're only one who are visible, not uh, audience. Okay, we, Got it. we ha you have Stephen, Steve, you have a reflection on, uh, uh, on your glasses. Yeah, I'll just, um, okay. it's, um, unfortunately they are um, the blue light canceling glasses. Right, right, that's um, what we see. We see which, re light. which reduce all of my, oh, hey Thomas, how's it going? Hi, here. Yeah. Cool, we are all here. Um, yeah, it was the, it was the blue light. Uh, if I need to read something, it may pop back on, but it's um, there's nothing I can do about blocking the blue light. So like, um, right. it enables me to do like ten meetings a day, you know, on yes. Zoom. <laughs> All right, I think it is officially time. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, this is the panel venture capital post COVID. I hope you're enjoying uh, the day or the evening, depending on where you are. For most of the panelists here, it's it's day moving into early evening or, or late afternoon. And I'd um, like to um, um, introduce the panel and get started. Um, my name is Steve Forte. I'm the managing partner at Fresco Capital, and I'm the moderator. So um, you won't be hearing much from me other than um, trying to get the conversation going, unless there's something very uh, specific to, um, to my experience that the panel draws me in on. So I'm going to let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with uh, Yoko. Hello. Yes, I'm Yoko Ahvenainen. And my background is that I have been serial entrepreneur and nowadays also investor. And I'm working especially in the uh, information technologies, including uh, data solutions, machine learning, and that kind of solutions. And also quite a lot actually in the fintech area and also now something also in the software robotics so that it is especially especially this kind of solutions to 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 basically automate and uh, and make machine learning and that kind of things okay great and then i'll move it over and i'm moving in the order that i see everyone on the screen i don't know <laughs> if the audience and yourself see it in the same which i think is when you're doing these zoom calls and these type of meetings i'm like hey the person on my left and then i realize they're not on the left of everybody else but the next person up will be uh sorry hi um i'm happy to participate in the panel um my background is in uh, my early background is in transactions investment banking corporate finance and m a and my later background has been uh, as president of a 1,200 person company, number two in a 350 person company. I've sat on public and private boards. About 12 years ago, I began uh, investing in startups with uh, impact. And they're all for profit. So I'm the founding investor in Leapfrog Investments, which 11 years later has $1.6 billion under management and uh, the portfolio companies grow 33% per year. Since investment, they reach 205 million people, of which 164 million are low income. Um, another investment that luckily just sold in February is Purpose Global, Purpose.com. We build uh, social movements for good, impacting a billion people. We have 130 people worldwide working on our impact initiatives and it was successfully sold to Capgemini in February. Uh, my other impact investments are uh, from Code Ocean, which does deals with reproducibility to a lot of health tech and FinTech, which I'll speak about later. Okay, great. And uh, next in my, uh, in my chain is, uh, actually the, the panelists don't even know who's next, so uh, the audience and panelists will be equally as surprised, but it's Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Garabedian. Uh, 
I have two roles. I am CEO of uh, an accelerator called Zontogeny, where we partner with early stage uh, companies in the life sciences space. Uh, so we partner with entrepreneurs, scientific founders, and provide seed capital and active management. And I also run a venture fund uh, for Perceptive Advisors. Uh, Perceptive has been around over 20 years as a strictly life science investor. Uh, they have about $8 billion of assets under management, but I launched their first pure play venture fund last year, uh, and we've already been deploying capital uh, and we're raising fund two. Great, thank you. And, and next, the next square up will be Raphael. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for for the time it's an honor to be here again and well my early background is on consultant business and then started in 2006 with private equity and venture capital in brazil i'm an asset manager here in brazil registered asset manager and in 2015 i founded eat the capital uh, which is investment boutique focused on uh, m a more specifically and energy infrastructure, and we have a uh, couple experiences as well in, in technology, but mainly on real economy with more hard assets, I would say. Great. And um, last but not least is Thomas with Blue Sky, which is something we're lacking here in Silicon Valley. So I, don't, I can't, see, can't see you being uh, in Silicon Valley today. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, hi, Thomas Thurston. I'm a partner and chief technology officer of W.R. Hambrick & Company. Um, it's a firm. It was Hambrick & Quist, and now it's Hambrick & Company. Um, the team's been at this for over 50 years. And um, aside from normal sort of Series A type investing the firm does, uh, we have a 10-person data science team in-house where we actually build analytics to look at our own deals and to scan markets. Um, so we augment kind of traditional venture with technology to help us find opportunities we look for. Great. Um, and with that, that is our panel. Um, we can't see the audience. I just see that there's nine folks there. So uh, the small crowd, we can probably, um, once we get through some of the initial uh, discussion, um, we can probably... I, believe I have mastered the uh, comment section so I can I can read aloud um, some questions so as as you get some questions and maybe um, uh, pull them along um, so let's get let's get started with the main topic which of course is you know a topic on a lot of people's minds from from limited partners to innovation economy folks to impact investors to venture capitalists and to founders you know what does venture capital like look like? post COVID and, and how is it being and in order to do that, the first topic I think this group wants to look at is how are we how are we dealing with it through COVID and how does that affect us post COVID? Like what are the what are the categories that are are big? What are the categories that are gonna be the winners? What are the losers? So the first question to the group comes um, what 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 I'm seeing in Silicon Valley is that in aggregate uh, venture capital has um, stayed the same or increased. Um, from that respect. So the, the question that I would have for the panel is, um, you know, what, where do you see an increase or a decrease in, in venture capital uh, through COVID? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, so in healthcare, uh, it's been thriving. And uh, part of that is obviously money going after uh, COVID opportunities. But most of the COVID vaccines and therapeutics have been coming from the large pharma and well-funded biotechs that were before COVID hit. But it's important to note the second quarter of this year, April, May, June, was the largest private equity infusion into the biotech sector in its 40 plus year history. So uh, that says a lot right there. Uh, but also it does seem that uh, deal flow, quality of deals, uh, just continues to remain uh, robust. And even in COVID with more of Zoom opportunities, people have adjusted very quickly to due diligence, to meet with even more teams than they might have been able to with in-person meetings or traveling uh, or having people travel you know, to VC firms. So uh, we've seen a lot of deal flow uh, just since COVID hit. We've done I think it's five deals ourselves, uh, Series A investments. So uh, I think at least as it relates to healthcare, uh, I haven't seen a slowdown. And, and those deals that you did were predominantly all in, in healthcare? Yeah, they, they were uh, biopharma, drug technologies mostly, one device and one diagnostic. I know, I know Thomas, you also invested in digital health and healthcare. Your thoughts as well? Yeah, I mean, the last couple of years, our firm has only been investing in healthcare. Um, 
And and I I will say what I've noticed ourselves and also talking to some other you know, investors is it's there's been a sort of a very disproportionate or a very scattered impact of COVID. So some some segments have done well and some have, have not done well. Maybe on the balance they're evening each other out a little bit. But obviously not by brilliant strategy, but by dumb luck we happened to be in healthcare when a pandemic hit. So. Um, I mean, almost all of our companies saw a big hockey stick, but a couple of them didn't. Uh, and they were based more on, for example, more uh, types where you know maybe a patient has to go into an office for that startup to become relevant. So, so we did see a few that have struggled, but overall, it's been a really nice windfall. Uh, however, I mean, you know, there's lots of specialized funds. Um, I know, you know, a lot of uh, you know folks that were focused on energy funds um, and a lot of industrial 4.0 types funds. Um, some of those have seen real struggles now um, you know, with cutbacks in manufacturing or with crashing at the energy sector. Uh, obviously, not every fund in those sectors is struggling, but it, it does seem to be, um, you know, when I when I talk to colleagues in the industry, I never know whether they're going to be telling me that this is just the best year ever or whether they're really in trouble and it was awful. <laughs> and I, I find it's been hard for me to predict how uh, COVID is going to be impacting different funds. You know, sometimes I think, oh, no brainer, you know, COVID shouldn't be a big issue. And then learning, of course, actually it is. So for me, it's kind of playing out. Um, and, and I think we're, we're all sort of waiting to see how it's going to affect the limited partners, right? The investors in our funds. And that seems to be uh, kind of a weird, it, it's not the reactions that I thought. And, and it seems to vary also quite a bit across who these limited partners are. Um, Everything from some that are locking up and holding cash and waiting for more quarters to tick by uh, so there's more data to others that are going on a buying spree. And and uh, anyway, so I, I'm still trying to make sense of it, but it's been a very dis- disparate impact across different uh, folks. Yeah. And, and on the limited partner front, I, I've been contacted by some folks that, you know, some of the limited partners, particularly the larger ones, have mandates of how much they're supposed to deploy in a year. And we're very conservative the first half. And now we're scrambling in the last quarter looking for the managers of the funds. Um, on the theme of before we switch gears on other sectors that are impacted, both positive or negatively by COVID and the VC space, um, just wanted, if, uh, if one of the other panelists want to hop on about that, I, I think one or two of you might have a have an opinion on that. I think, sorry, I think you yeah. look like you're ready. <laughs> so um, I have, um, I invest in pre a generally deals. So I'm very, very early in helping sort of even uh, uh, in terms of, you know, preparing the deck or pivoting, which has happened during COVID. But quite a few of my deals touch on health, health, health tech and uh, leapfrog investments has, you know, Originally, the concept at, at LeapFrog was micro-insurance, that little bits of insurance would give a safety net to the very poor, and where they would have one untoward event, and it would disproportionately affect their life. So having property and casualty and health insurance has made a huge difference. So we've seen, obviously, an uptick of cases. It's been a little bit hard because... Enrollments are a little bit slow because of kind of the uh, disconnect within the within the Southeast Asia, India, and Africa. Um, but overall, it's you know it's been a growth sector. Um, through purpose, we uh, a number a few of our our initiatives went on hold, and um, we actually raised five million dollars for the UN to launch something called Verified to verify health information and, you know, any to verify, to make sure that people, you know, got correct information. We also launched, besides some of these other companies, and if you raise money at a good or higher valuation than the last valuation, um, and they, a number of them had COVID initiatives, like Code Ocean, which deals with reproducibility, we gave free, free data storage and free uh, ability to run algorithms and uh, data through codeocean.com. Biosha, which is a high tech, a health tech company, it leverages next generation DNA and proprietary AI software. It det- it gives precision infectious disease diagnosis. So whereas COVID was not directly involved, we actually got involved in COVID testing. We were able to get a provisional uh, FDA approval for a lab. And um, and now, frankly, are, are switching a little bit or, or directing some attention to uh, to our uh, infectious disease 
we have the largest database of pathogens in the world. Hiro is a plug and play company, and we actually offered free services for hospitals. Um, and uh, the, pro the companies that were most at risk had were pre-product. And uh, one of the deals was trustee.care. And we, we were in the middle of a convertible note that froze, meaning that nobody was investing for two, three months. But we actually closed it out in August at double our minimum uh, for closing. And so the, the deal- That's impressive. <laughs> I will tell you, they called me up saying, you know what, we're gonna run out of money in April. So I said to them, because I'm the founding angel and, and a intense advisor for them, I said, I'm covering you for May and June, so let's take that off the table and let's go look and redo the deck. So uh, anyway, that turned out to be very successful. The other thing that was helpful in a number of these deals was the PPP. Uh, nice. And that actually- uh, and, and for the non- Interrupt real fast for the non-US or, or just folks not plugged into the US market. That was a government program that extended payroll for um, about three, two and a half to two and a half months, um, which basically paid the payroll. It was a, a, in some cases, a forgivable loan or an extremely low interest loan, depending on the size of the organization. Yeah, we, we have we have a similar uh, scheme here in Brazil as well. And for for the COVID, just a, a quick comment. We have we have like the Brazilian real devaluated a lot uh, during COVID periods, so it it, it opened uh, a huge opportunity for buyers outside Brazil to come and buy assets. So we have been seeing a lot of movement on renewable energy space, which is our main area of work here: solar, uh, wind, and and hydro. And we also see, we saw this week, uh, Advent, it's a big private equity firm, announced a $2 billion fund for Latin. They just raised, mainly because the assets are, are really low, uh, at, at low valuations uh, in dollar terms as well. So uh, the COVID impact, I would say, it is big on, on venture capital and private equity here in the region. And um, well, we've talked a lot about healthcare, and I would like to then bring up um, one topic from that extends to what Sari said, which is about the follow-on investments in the portfolio, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and we want to talk about the other sectors other than healthcare that are booming. But I want to pick uh, Yoko's brain about entrepreneurs and what are the or what are the sections that you're hearing that are not doing well, since a lot of the panel has expertise in healthcare. Um, I can speak a little bit to that too, but uh, this, is, this is your show, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't do too much with healthcare, at least directly. Um, I, I actually uh, remember when the whole situation started in, I think that mid March, when Sequoia sent this letter that was a little bit panic to the market that that okay, we are now back in two thousand eight, and right. it will be More very time tough CEOs. time. Yeah, exactly, and uh, then. I, I think that they, there was a little bit panic, may, maybe two or three weeks. But I, I think that especially in our area, that, that is basically online uh, software, data-based solutions, I think that it started to stabilize very quickly. And people also started to see the opportunities. And I think that um, in, in, in many those areas, where we are active, this has been actually excellent time for the business. As somebody said that five-year development has happened in five months, when people basically learn to use new services. I, I, I mean, even very basic things like that, that uh, uh, digital signing of the documents. I assume that it has gone up very rapidly. <laughs> and then beyond that, there are many other things. Of course, if we think, for example, this platform we are now using for this conference, this, uh, uh, how was it called, uh, Run the World. It's basically the startup that has collected, I think, that 15 million since March. So that uh, these are good examples that in, in many areas they have been a rapid development. And I, I want to mention, for example, three companies in our portfolio. One, how people can manage their personal data and basically get better security and utilize better their personal data. It has become definitely more important in this situation. 
Also, another company that is basically working with uh, robotic process automation, software robots, they have been increasing demand. And also, uh, one more that is actually the latest one in, in my portfolio that is basically building solutions how people can trust to each other online. New kind of solutions to create trust networks and that kind of things. I think that the situation has basically helped many people to understand the need for this kind of new solutions and also first time to use them. So, so that in, 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 in that way, I think that in business itself, but also in the investment side, we have seen a lot of positive development. Of course, at the same time, I understand that there are also sectors that have now very tough time, but fortunately, uh, I, I haven't been too much involved in those areas. Yeah, and I, I think we will definitely get that. And um, one thing I would like to do is, you know, we do, we have a, a question from the audience, um, which also I think tails into the conversation here, which uh, Nicole from the audience is, is basically asking us, um, what are the long-term impacts going to be from COVID-19 and, um, you know, on, on investment, right? Obviously societal, we're not necessarily qualified to give that opinion. Though I found that a lot of VCs in the early days of COVID thought they were epidemiologists. I thought that was interesting, uh, but that's a different story. You know, because we understand power laws, that makes us an expert on R not, but you know, that is what it is. Um, but to dive, we, we could dive a little deeper into Nicole's question, but I'll take the first half of her question here is we've talked about healthcare and we've talked about some of the other things like Run the World, which is the platform we're using. You know, my portfolio, just to give some flavor, is we do digital health, we do future of work, and we do education technology. So I'm seeing nothing but a boom. You know, I've, I've had a handful of companies struggle because their end customers are in, are in travel or in other areas. So they're, they're hurting, but the, the overwhelming majority of the portfolio is doing quite well. So besides digital health, um, future of work, which is a lot like run the world, like what we're the platform on now, things that Yoko was just mentioning. Um, the panel hasn't mentioned, but I'll throw education technology out there since we're rethinking education. What are some other sectors that will have a positive benefit um, due to COVID as we rethink things? And then we'll, we'll unpack that and then we'll come back. What are some of the sectors that have a negative impact? Um, Anyone, um, I'll, I'll, you know, not being in person, I usually look for body language on a panel. So, um, I, I, I think that at least e e-commerce is one easy answer. That okay. Much more e-commerce and definitely very significant new situation in the retail business. So that I think that this will have long term impact how people are buying things in the future. So behavior changes due to COVID. Yeah. Right. And I, I make I make the argument, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. Um, I believe Thomas mentioned about limited partners. You know, what are they going to feel? And like, you know, in the old days, limited partners wouldn't make an investment unless they met you in person. Like now they have to meet you across Zoom and other facilities. So people who are afraid of e-commerce could definitely be um, pushed, you know, now they kind of have to. Right. So um, I think that may, I think that is a good one. Anyone disagree or want to add a different sector that they think will be a boom? And then we'll circle back and look at the ones that um, will be a bit of a bust. Well, I think that uh, uh, people looking for purposeful investment. So I think that that piece is being added onto the due diligence as well, you know, and, and in that sense, covering environmental, social and governance issues. And I think that there's a lot, lot more interest in whatever it is that there that it is sustainable, and I think that's a you know a big trend that has you know accelerated a couple of years. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we were we were at the beginning a few years ago. We were at the beginning of an arc of impact and sustainability, right? And I think that COVID has forced us all to think of our priorities, and that is definitely key. Yeah. It's a little bit generational too, meaning the younger generation are putting these issues more forward. And now that younger generation has a bigger voice. Um, I'm looking at the bottom of my screen, uh, Chris, uh, Raphael and Thomas, if you have anything to weigh in um, either on, you know, impact or uh, e-commerce, or if you want to disagree with one of those, um, playing Mike Wallace a little bit, um, or if <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> well, he, he, he didn't have to get them to disagree, right? Um, well, or, um or yeah, if you want I, to add say, I, I, I can't comment on uh, non-healthcare, but I think the, the healthcare boom is also related to consumer, right, empowerment, 
moving things to the home setting, not having to go into you know hospitals to participate in clinical trials, FDA trying to embrace you know even apps. Uh, there was a recently approved uh, device, which is an iPad to treat ADHD. So I think you know healthcare bleeds in to a lot of these consumerish and and other yeah. sectors. And I think again that like telemedicine, uh, it has just kind of fueled more growth in those as well. Yeah, and, and you've hit the nail on the head of what my business partner, the other managing partner at Fresco says is, we're not seeing a boom in healthcare and education technology and future of work. We're seeing the at-home economy, like a new sector that we haven't thought of. And healthcare, mm-hmm. as you said, just bleeds into that trend because A, we're stuck at home, but B, now we're making our home have more infrastructure mm-hmm. to handle all of this. Yeah, yeah and, and I'll give you a less than a half-baked thought, but as, as I was listening, you know, it, it occurred to me, you know, wouldn't it be interesting? I mean, if 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 the pandemic had happened just a few years earlier, maybe one generation earlier in venture years, we wouldn't probably have Uber, Airbnb, or WeWork, right? Because uh, and so so it's kind of fascinating to see how this this you know we don't know what disruptions we're not going to have, uh, and we might know some some new ones, but it's amazing how the timing of, of all of this, um, it's going to affect history in ways we, we can't even see. Right. Um, but, it, you know, when I when I start to think back of a lot of things around the gig economy and a lot of things that were really starting to take off, you know, conversations we might have had at this conference a year or two ago uh, are almost almost universally, not in t- but stopped in their tracks. Um, so, so in a way, you know, in anything with um, a lot of anything involved travel, anything involved getting people together, anything that are are now, those are basically all stopped. And sometimes it's harder to notice things that stopped than to notice things that started. Um, And we weren't investing in a lot of those spaces, obviously, but I just, oh my gosh, that a lot of trains are are now just sitting idle uh, when they were rolling ahead full steam, even a year or two ago. Do you think a year from now, let's hope a year from now, the pandemic's starting to be in the rearview mirror. Do you think those things will spin back up? Just obviously they'll be a little different, or do you think that we lost a generation? Like it might be just the next generation of entrepreneurs, which in VC terms might mean three to five years, right? The next gen or 10 years, right? The next generation of entrepreneurs will handle those. Yeah. I mean, if I could argue with myself out loud, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> please you know, do, the, the, please do. <laughs> and then, yeah, then I can argue with everyone else, but you know, I, I mean, I think, I think for sure there, there's a generation of opportunities that are just they're just going to die uh, because people might run out of cash or not have the opportunities they would have had. Now, I, I do happen to think creative destruction uh, still finds interesting ways to bring things that are awesome that we never thought of. So, so maybe we won't even notice, but th- there's definitely going to be some winners and losers that would not have happened, but for this pandemic. And and I wish I knew what they all were. Um, so, but, but I, I, yeah, no, but I, I mean, I, I do find that, kind of fascinating. And especially as the world was getting more global uh, and the acceleration of that was happening. I mean, everyone was on Instagram in Bali all of a sudden, right? Like everybody was everywhere all the time. Um, and so much of that is, is, is on pause and maybe gone for good. And, and we, so, so, but I, I do agree though. I mean, certainly digitization and personalization, which were already happening across industries have, have really been fueled, right? And now they're, they're going twice as fast. Um, so, so anyway, that was more of a comment than any insight but I, I thought I'd throw it out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can give at yeah. least one example. One company that didn't happen that I talked with one entrepreneur early this year that he was basically planning a kind of service that when you travel, that you have a kind of global access to local fitness centers. So no, that right. uh, it, it would, could I say, a little bit like Airbnb for the fitness centers. Wherever you go, you can easily get access somewhere. And I, I can tell that that plan is now on hold. Well, double double whammy, right? Because people aren't traveling and gyms are closed, right? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> even if you were to join that locally, right? It's, uh, Raphael, I want to give you a yeah, chance if you want to weigh in on um, some, of the, yeah, some of the sectors no, sure. that are up and coming. And then we'll, tr- and then I think, yeah. Chris, uh, I mean, um, Thomas's point was good about, we'll, we'll transition after you, Raphael, to um, other areas that are negative. Okay. So on the positive side, I, th- I think I agree with everyone uh, that uh, food, food delivery, uh, e-commerce, uh, uh, all kind of things uh, will, will be, will be in, a, in a growth. I, I'm, uh, what Thomas, Thomas said one thing that make me, made me think, 
It's interesting because probably the the leaders, the industry leaders, will will become bigger probably because the the guys who are trying to to disrupt the sector need cash and they will have like cash burn and probably will not will not survive uh, in in a, in a general general uh, discussion, not specifically in any sector, just. The guys who are disrupting, trying to to cash burn. Not not everyone ha, ha, has the opportunity of Uber of ha, has like a, a huge cash burn and still is still there with, with with a lot of investors backing them. So the guy the guy suffered a lot. Uh, we, we will see some 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 leaders uh, taking more market share. In my view. And, and other industry such as education, everything online, even a deal we have on client in, in Europe, they, they, they have like a solution for M&A deals to do 100% uh, by offline, uh, but not, not present, like the online, online platform to M&A deals, which actually is not, it's not really common. So that we have seen, we, we, we have been, uh, seeing some some uh, developments on that side on deals deal structuring uh, on on tech, technology based uh, M and A which is not listed company listed equity or or even it's not crowdfunding like a deal specific deal doing 100 percent online of course in the real economy such as like renewable energy you need to visit the site but on on 100 percent technology deal it's possible to do M and A. Um, uh, uh, not, not seeing the person uh, physically, which is, is a new thing. And, yeah, uh, and I don't know if, uh, yeah, I know if we, if we, after a vaccine, if, if we will have like, let, let's say some, some industry such an event or anything gathering people, uh, sports uh, events, etc. that will be such a, like a depressed demand that people try to, to, to go to the events and to go to music, Halls or or a sports event, things like this. Maybe after vaccine, think things will be like a peak in, in demand uh, on on the the sectors that suffered more. But it's it's his only a thought. No, it's probably catch up, right? I think you know people those those events catching up. Like if you usually go to one event every two years, and we've been home for over a year, you probably try to catch up. Right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, I think I think those are very insightful. I I, I think we hit. I, actually, I think we had an easy job picking the winners, right? Um, Thomas's thought experiment um, is the second half of Nicole's question, right? You know, so what are the sectors that we feel might be lacking, right? Um, so, I mean, we know it's obviously travel and things like that. Are there anything that is there anything that we're we're missing, right? Um, something that um, like a second order effect, right? I, you know, because you know, like just like um, Yoko mentioned, like if you're not traveling, you're obviously not going to the gym on the road, right? So things like that are, you know, so obviously, um, you know, that may or may not be popular moving forward, but are there are some of the ones that we're missing longer term, right? And, and, and to play devil's advocate, are these bumps artificial, right? So one of my, one of my ed tech companies in my portfolio is, is, is done a 500 or 600% growth this year. And they're planning for next year to only be um, like two X from last year, right? You know, so basically to, to, you know, lower 300%, right? So still, you know, so the same, we're going to get this big bump and it will stay higher, but we're going to, it's still going to, you know, 2022 or 2021 will be lower, right? Um, so what, so, you know, are, are there some other obvious um, candidates that we missed that will not um, do well over the next two to three years as, as the world recovers? And then by consequence, you know, are some of the booms that we're seeing in these industries like Instacart, like healthcare, um, you know, are, are, are some of those going to be temporary? Um, let, I want to pick at that a little bit. I, again, can't profess any wisdom, but, um, you know, you made me think that with digitization, right, and that, that's certainly accelerating. We know that, you know, um, you know, digital markets, competitive markets amongst companies tend to be more binary in that when you have digital technologies, there's usually a network effect in a business model. You know, there's only one Facebook because everybody's on that Facebook, so to speak, right? So, um, so they so they tend to be more zero sum when you have really digital businesses where network effects are a part of it. So so what what I'm the reason I bring that up is because I think um, because digitization digitization is accelerating, we're going to see the rise of companies that where network effects are critical, and and you're going to see a lot more sort of uh, market leaders 
which means it's a really bad time to be second, third, or fourth in a market that's winner take all. Um, and so I think it's never been, I mean, Me Too strategies have never been sort of anybody's favorite, but I think if digitization is becoming a bigger, bigger role, you pay a much higher cost. I mean, there is no point in being the seventh biggest Snapchat, right? Because you basically have zero value. Um, so so we might we might see stronger incumbency for those companies that do rise and, and harder times for those companies that are a little late to the game or aren't differentiated enough. Sure, it's um, pretty and, and I'm also seeing, I don't know about anyone else, but um, big companies, uh, you know, with stable balance sheets are starting to buy things quite a bit. Now, I've just noticed even in the last month, for some reason, everybody's buying things. <laughs> And, and I think they're realizing this is an opportunity where they do have stable balance sheets and they can go out and try to get discounts or just, just grab technologies and assets when a lot of their competitors might be struggling and not have as stable. So kind of fewer big startups starting to dominate segments and big incumbents getting outsized leads over their peers. So I, it seems to me that there's going to be you know, more, more victory at the top and, and more struggle kind of in the middle. Anyway, that, that's a feeling I'm starting to get. I've been surprised by all the deal activity, to be honest with you, from these corporates. Uh, it's just very recent. Yeah, I, I think there's another element, though, on kind of um, going upstream, right, where it starts with the entrepreneur. And I, I think we can't discount the fact that the macro markets have remained relatively healthy. And so the fact that if you look at the U.S. markets, uh, and you look, you know, even NASDAQ, you look back a year ago and it's up significantly from a year ago, even though there was a quick downturn uh, in, in March for COVID. And so I think when entrepreneurship gets tightened is when, uh, you know, their, their, their uh, stock portfolio isn't worth as much, right? Their family doesn't want them to take risks. When things are good in the macro environment, it still fuels the entrepreneurial you know, and, and new ventures. And I think that's where we have not seen a slowdown. People seem pretty confident in their financial situation, even though there are some sectors that got disproportionately hurt more than others. Uh, but I, I have not seen a slowdown of people jumping in to that risk, you know, uh, venture uh, model. Other folks want to weigh in on that? I, I think that a kind of additional point is that this is not only what will happen after COVID, but it's also that what's going on in world economy, then I would say that there are quite many global political questions also, for example, China uh, and uh, many other things. So that uh, the, the development as a whole, it's of course combination of many, many factors. And uh, in, in, in that way, I think that there are, it, it's really hard to say that how st- stable anything is. But at the same time, I think that there are definitely areas that there are opportunities. Okay. And um, we have a, we have a question, question from Rufus in the audience, and I'll, I'll paraphrase. And he, he basically said is, you know, all the things that we said are, you know, strong uh, benefit from being remote and all the things that we're saying are weak, you know, have a disadvantage, but of course we're at home, right? Or, you know, so are um, things that are in person. So th- his question, which is less of a tech question and more of a philosophical question is, are we, are, is the human race going to be um, the remote first, you know, moving forward post COVID, right? And I think Raphael, you were, you were alluding to that a little bit, um, but curious what the, what the panel thinks. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the companies in our group is a, uh, travel uh, management company, you know, which is uh, heavily impacted, badly impacted during this period, as you can imagine. And although we still believe the the presence of human beings, um, it it is is possible to do this kind of meeting. Of course, it's better than Kai Skies in Portugal, the last, the, the, the last, uh, the last editions, last editions of Horaces. But it is, of course, it is possible to do a very good panel, uh, remotely. But other things is, uh, that are just impossible. Like, uh, I was in Milan, as you, you know, last week to, to talk to a client. It was a very specific matter, very delicate, uh, matter. I needed to fly and, 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 and dedicate like, 
10 days to, to, to clear the, the, the specific issue. So I think the relationship between human beings, uh, if you are too isolated, actually it's, 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 uh, the, for the healthcare guys, uh, uh, the, it's, it's considered a disease. Like it's, uh, if you are too isolated to other people, uh, I think human beings are social, uh, uh, beings and then we need we need to to after vaccine i think probably have like depressed uh demand for a lot of gathering uh sectors that we can meet people and go shopping and and and, and hug and, and 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 have have more physical contact with people in general not only a family that's what we're having now so i don't believe we we're we going to become a, a remote society in a broader term uh, if if that's the rufus questions uh, i think which is a great question but i i i i i should believe that people i there are some things that are not possible to be uh, totally totally uh, exchanged for technology and remote remote contact so, um, and 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 i i i think after the vaccine we will the new normal that we are discussing now, probably more technology, more more uh, e-commerce, more other things, more uh, uh, more habits that are, that will change. Of course, behavior behavior change, but not the essential of the human being of of seeing other people or of, uh, having fun and meeting meeting and gathering. I don't think this will change. Yeah, I'll I'll just make a comment on that topic. So. Uh, it, it's in a in a similar way, right? Uh, you know, post nine eleven, right? We saw the way we travel and go through security and all of that, and everybody adjusted, and now that's the new norm. And what I think is going to happen until we have a vaccine or effective treatments that can be you know expanded globally, you already have businesses adjusting to this kind of. I mean, restaurants are pulling their you know uh, tables apart, but others that are going to be innovative are going to find a way to make consumers feel safe and those businesses will likely become the norm, right? Or they'll have a differentiated advantage over companies that aren't adapting to this new protective kind of way of going about, uh, you know, our world business. And so I I do think that uh, we're not going to become a remote based society, but I think we're going to see fundamental changes of how we gather. And uh, I think the businesses that step up to protect the consumer will will win out in this in this era. I mean, I, I lived in Asia post SARS, and like temperature checks at airports were normal. Like you know, and then I moved back to the United States, you know, about seven or eight years ago, and like I kind of forgot about them, right? You know, now that they'll come here, I mean, everyone adjusted. Like when you walked into a country, you filled out your health declaration, you did the temperature. I mean, it was yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of these things will change, except we might have to do it to go into the school or do go into the grocery store or whatever. You know, I'm looking forward to. Uh, I mean, I focus on a, a post-vaccine era um, where you almost have options, where you really had to show up for meetings. You, if you were on a Zoom or or in a in a conference where people came together for a company, like eight people in a room and two are in Zoom, you felt like you were the outsider. But um, I love to travel, you know, both for business and pleasure. So I'm looking forward to that. But I'm looking. But the whole thing is, is that for the first time, you could actually, you know, successfully be in a Zoom meeting. You could actually not necessarily get on a plane, really, for sometimes a two-hour meeting. So I, I think that'll be. Yeah, and those are some of the, the positive externalities. You know, like if, you know, Chris said we'll have some changes, but like we're rethinking some of these. You know, we're rethinking some of our behaviors. Yeah, um, if, just if, to let if, you know, um, you want to go, Yoko? Oh, no, I guess I'll make it. But, uh, you know, if the pendulum swings back, I hope it only goes back about halfway because, um, you know, 40, 40 weeks of travel was too much. Zero might be too little. Let's get it down to like 15 and then we'll split, right? <laughs> so. I, I think I think that's actually what, right. And, and we've got um, only 90 seconds ago. I don't, I don't know if they abruptly cut us off. I was on an event yesterday where they did. So um, under that notion, we're going to do a lightning round. Um, since we've both brought up travel and two-hour meetings, um, so this is really kind of off topic, but I'm going to ask each panelist and to, to say, you know, in a post-pandemic world, where is the place you want to go first? Yoko, you're you're in the hot seat. Uh, 
it's hard to say. May, maybe for many places I travel typically so so much, and I have said that now it would be a good time to buy own airline. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, sorry. I have a daughter who uh, uh, works for Sidewalk Labs in New York and uh, got on a plane and lives moved to Nairobi. And I look forward to seeing her in Kenya. She got a big awesome. promotion despite working remote. <laughs> All right. Uh, 30 seconds, Chris. Uh, just somewhere uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. We'll <laughs> figure out a nice city, but uh, the Mediterranean. And, uh, Raphael, something other than Milan, I assume. Okay. No, uh, Japan, uh, the, the last five years I've been at least twice in Japan and this year n n not in Japan and also South Africa for, for the first time. Okay. And Thomas. If I don't go see my dad, he'll kill me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think our time is up. It says the, uh, the talk time is the end. So I'd like to thank the panelists. I'd like to thank the folks who participated with Q and A. And then of course, I'd like to thank the folks that just um, sat and listened. I hope, I hope we um, entertained you as well as informed you. That's the goal. And um, if um, we did a good job, uh, the panelists get all the credit. If we did a bad job, I will assume the role of Mike Wallace and accept all responsibility. <laughs> um, <laughs> until next time, uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all.